Okay. Okay, great. I think we, I think we're set now. All right. Yeah, we need to go into full screen. We need to go into full screen. Full screen. Yeah. Full screen. Yeah. Sure. Coming. There you go. Okay. Great. Excellent. Um, so, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on operations challenges in for East Africa businesses during the COVID nineteen. Um, so I'm Eric Ducroix from Kaizen Consult, uh, consulting and advisory firm, specialized in supply chain and operations um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, including lean methodologies and tools. We support international and local organizations to set up a lean supply chain, optimize their operations, and get into a culture of continuous improvement. <laughs> Facilitating uh, this webinar today with Jonathan Das uh, from Delta Blade Consultants. Uh, so, Jonathan, if you want to introduce yourself to in the organization. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. If I can ask everybody else to please go on mute, or if you can put everybody else on mute, uh, Eric, that would be great because I've had some background uh, noise. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jonathan Das and I run a consulting firm called Delta Blade. And I'll be co-hosting this uh, panel today. So similarly to uh, Kaizen Consult, we're lean and Kaizen consultants that improve productivity and efficiency in the workplace. And we do this using lean methodologies borrowed from the Toyota ways of working. Um, together with this, we also provide a data analytics service where we use technology like USSD, our Android app, integration into ERPs to gather, analyze data and translate it into useful information that allows our clients, and clients to act on so as to increase their profitability and competitiveness. So I'll hand you back to Eric to discuss a little bit more around the introduction and the house rules. All right, um, thank you, Jonathan. Um, so in the current context, um, a global pandemic affecting all economies around the world, some countries have been par partially closing their borders, uh, putting in place some lockdowns um, and preventing the workers sometimes to go to their workplace, disrupting the normal channels of supply chain and distributions um, and therefore the operations of businesses. Uh, because of that, um, because of the length of that period and the uncertainty, the uncertainty it brings, uh, businesses have to adjust their operations, their processes, uh, and find innovative solutions to keep delivering their, um, to their customers. Today, we want to explore with our panel uh, the challenges they have faced during that period um, and how they have addressed them. Um, so we are very excited uh, to get started with this webinar today. And we have a broad range of great executives um, from leading organizations in East Africa, uh, from a range, wide range of countries and industries. Uh, I am sure they will bring great insights um, on their operational challenges uh, and some of the solutions they have put in place. Uh, but first, a little bit of housekeeping um, and about the structure of the webinar. Um, so we would like to start with about 45 minutes uh, discussion with our panel. Uh, on the subject of operational challenges in East Africa. Um, and then we'll leave about 15 minutes um, to try to answer some of the questions um, you in the audience have. And um, so please do leave some, um, some questions in the chat box during the discussion and uh, we'll try to compile them and you know, uh, try to have them answered at the end of the call, uh, at the end of the session. Uh, during this webinar, try to keep um, your videos off uh, to save a little bit on the bandwidth um, and uh, uh, the mics off uh, as well to, uh, to avoid any disturbance uh, to the discussion. And as for the panelists, uh, you can keep the videos on uh, to, to be able to see your face and um, we'll let you know if you're on mute when you're talking. All right. Um, so. Today we have the chance to welcome about six panelists from different companies and different sectors and activities. All executives or organizations operating in countries in East Africa. 
Um, they're located in Kenya, in Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, in Tanzania, in Uganda. And they will bring a wealth of expertise uh, to our discussion. I'd like to welcome our panelists. Um, I would like each of you to give a, a brief introduction about yourself, your organization, and the business you're in. Um, and then you could give the audience um, a brief idea of the main challenges that you have faced, the operational challenges you have faced during that, the, the last few months um, and how they impacted your, uh, your, your operations. Um, so I'd like to start with, um, oops, sorry, with Arman, um, Mr. Arman Wau, uh, who's the managing director of Textbook Center, who's based in Kenya. Arman, if, you, if you'd like to give a few words. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. My name is Armand. I'm uh, fortunate to be leading a textbook center, which is uh, one of the largest textbook centers in East Africa. Uh, we see ourselves as a diversified bookseller because we not only sell books, but uh, we sell everything that contributes to the promotion of uh, education and culture uh, across, uh, across East Africa, uh, mainly based in Nairobi. Uh, we're a team of uh, roughly 350 employees with a large retail presence uh, in Nairobi and uh, distribution across, uh, across Kenya and also across East Africa. Uh, and unfortunately, we've been, uh, like all of us, uh, deeply impacted by, uh, by this uh, pandemic crisis. And we've had to almost kind of reinvent our business overnight uh, to be able to survive. So I'd be more than happy to share, to share more, more details uh, about what we've been doing and what has been kind of helping us. I wouldn't say that we've been highly successful because we're still trying to navigate through this, uh, uh, through this, uh, this crisis. Um, but uh, the supply chain imp impact has been uh, pretty deep and we've been uh, having pretty much to look at uh, how we can keep getting products because we mainly import and we have a small line of manufacturing in China. Uh, how we can switch from uh, overnight from a uh, global supply chain where we import from uh, South, uh, South uh, America, North America, Western uh, Europe, and Southeast Asia uh, to mainly relying on what we have here locally uh, and uh, that is accessible in East Africa, along with trying to find ways to, uh, to reach our customers that are you know, on, uh, on lockdown for the, for, for the majority of them. So it has been quite a journey, uh, and I think we're just unfortunately at the beginning of it because as we know, COVID is not going uh, anywhere anytime soon. Uh, so looking forward to discuss this with you and also learn from, uh, from uh, the other panelists on what they've been doing to keep their business going. Great. Um, thank you, Amma. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce uh, our ship, um, Aimé, our ship, Lobo and Goomba, who's um, the co-founder and chief of operations for uh, Nuru. Uh, in uh, based in uh, DRC. Uh, Arship, if you want to say a few words. Arship, go ahead. Um, sorry, I was on mute. So, um, thanks for, um, for giving me this opportunity, um, Eric, to share about um, um, Nuru. Um, uh, so um, uh, I am Ashib Lobo, uh, 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 Nuru co-founder and the chief of, of, of operations. And, and Nuru is uh, an energy company that operates in, in, in Eastern Congo. Um, uh, uh, and our aim is to provide uh, to more, uh, more uh, for about 5 million delighted clients um, a world-class connectivity um, 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 by um, um, September 24, 2024. And um, we are actually now uh, operating uh, in Eastern DRC, many in Goma, where we have deployed um, uh, 1.3 megawatts of a solar hybrid system um, um, uh, l uh, since last, um, last February of this year. And um, we have been uh, um, um, seriously um, experiencing the, the COVID-19 impact on our, uh, um, uh, our, 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 our ability to operate. And since most of um, um, our goods 
equipment materials are outsourced uh, from several places, Kenya, uh, the US, Europe, China. Um, uh, and, and right now, um, we are facing many challenges to, um, to really um, uh, uh, keep deploying our, our distribution uh, infrastructure. And since all the pools cables, uh, we, we, we source them from outside. So, um, uh, and you know, DRC is one of the countries that depends on, 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 on different borders, Kenya, um, um, uh, port in, in Mombasa, Uganda and Rwanda. So, uh, and uh, we also depends really on uh, the global trans transportation um, uh, uh, systems. So with the COVID-19 right now, you know, everything is kind of slowing down. And even um, the, 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 the production um, uh, in the world is also going, so, going slow, um, uh, which is really um, affecting our ability uh, to bring goods in DRC, um, uh, knowing that we are just in, in two months of, um, um, uh, of, our, of, of our commercial phase. So, um, the, um, um, uh, and you know, uh, it's, 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 it's a bit of challenge for, uh, for, for, for new uh, that way. We um, also, you know, we are also having uh, really a social distances and limited staff as, as many customs and borders, which is just slowing the slowing um, the really our ability to clear goods at a real time. Um, and, and the direct impact is on, 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 on our markets. We are not being able to really connect more clients and to, to reach out our project, projection revenue as uh, we, we, we planned before. So those are kind of um, uh, the examples, but also our, our Currency is, 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 is really experiencing a lot of uh, uh, inf inflation in the local market. So it's also impacting seriously um, um, our ability to, to make the revenue as we projected. So I'll be eager to share more with uh, all, the, um, uh, all the panelists and to learn also from you guys about how COVID has been impacting um, the supply chain. Excellent. Thank you, Aship. <clears throat> Um, so next, I'd like to introduce Kevin Shah, um, who's the Managing Director of Rosewood Kenya. Um, Kevin. Good morning, guys. Thanks for setting this up. My name is Kevin Shah. I'm um, currently the CEO at Rosewood Furniture. Uh, we are a family business started about 27 years ago in Kenya and mainly uh, focus on the supply of office furniture into multi-sectors in Kenya and East Africa from you know individual households to all the way up to the top telcos and corporates and government and uh, we also run a serviced office business called the business bar um, and we're seeing a change in that market too so I think in terms of the last few months office furniture primarily relying on people sitting in offices has taken a significant hit because most people have been working from home at least in that first shock phase and we found that that was obviously the first um, hold on sort of capital expenditure and growing your office stuff so we've seen that first phase just about come to an end where the shock and the working from home has now sort of moved into the back to work movement um, coming to work safely whether offices are doing hygiene programs they're introducing screens, social distancing, but people are realizing that they do need to come to work. And so we found that side. On the supply chain and distribution, obviously we manufacture half of our furniture, all our desking is locally manufactured. So that's continued, but realizing that small things like a screw or a bolt that we might import as part of a desk might be critical to, uh, from, that we might import. So we've had to sort of come up with innovative solutions around final products. And we import our seating solutions from China, Malaysia, and Korea. And they were obviously affected in different ways. So we had to obviously find alternatives there as well. So yeah, that's my introduction. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so next I'd like to introduce you to uh, Hugo Herte, um, Operations Director and Acting Managing Director for uh, Phoenix International. He is based in Uganda. Uh, Hugo, go ahead. 
Hi, everybody. Um, so as uh, Eric said, my name is uh, Hugo. I'm, uh, um, I'm originally from Montreal, Canada, and, but I've been living and working in East Africa since uh, 2010. Um, I'm, you may have heard of Phoenix International. Uh, Phoenix is known widely uh, for a, a solar home system line of business. Um, but uh, two years ago, Phoenix decided to uh, explore the space of clean cooking. So uh, what my division is doing right now is we are um, launching and trying, trying a new business model to uh, make uh, cooking with LPG more affordable and more accessible. Uh, to achieve that, it's essentially uh, we use an approach of decentralize um, LPG cooking. So basically the cylinders everybody sees in their uh, kitchen um, that is then mounted uh, with a uh, controller that allow people to buy uh, gas on a pay as you go basis. So people can buy as little as um, uh, 15 cents of gas just for some quick cooking. Um, and uh, in parallel to that, we also offer some uh, credit facility for people to eventually own the cook stove. Uh, the objective is simply to make, uh, to reduce the barrier of entry into the clean cooking uh, like business, essentially. Um, so uh, yeah, so that, that's what we do. Um, right now, some of the key challenges we've faced, um, our upstream supply chain has not really been disrupted. Um, there are some, um, I mean, there's some like samples that we usually try to get quick and ship by plane, uh, that we've had difficulty to get in Uganda. Um, but, uh, especially with, yeah, because of the, uh, the lack of commercial flights, uh, there's no more cargo uh, or a lot less coming into the country uh, through air freight. Um, but generally the upstream has been okay. For us, it's really been the downstream uh, sort of because we do the last mile distribution, which means that we, uh, once our customers have run out of gas, we need to go to their house. We need to uh, replace the cylinder. That has created a whole lot of uh, problems, especially in Uganda, there's a curfew that is in place from 7 p.m. to uh, 6 a.m. Uh, so we have to operate within shorter work hours. For a long time, there was no public transport, so we had to find a way for our employees to go to the workplace. Um, cars were forbidden for a while, so we had to resort to using motorbikes um, or provide company motorbike for employees to even be able to move from their house to the workplace. Um, and then the customer interaction became much more fraught. So uh, it becomes really about like, how do you um, provide social distancing wherein our field technicians are expected to go into people's home, uh, wearing masks, disinfecting. Then the cylinder itself becomes a potential source of the disease. Um, so those have been a, a series of challenge. In addition, we had to stop um, our whole customer acquisition process. Uh, our customer acquisition relied on uh, doing demonstration in open market or at uh, supermarkets. Um, now these are no longer possible. Uh, so it, it's about changing how can we attract, like put our product forward, interest customers. Um, and the, th the third one is really about like, um, I haven't been to the office in four months. Um, so it's really hard to get, to stay connected to your staff in uh, this circumstance. So that's it. Excellent. Thank you, Hugo. Um, next in line uh, is Kibaya Erisanya. Uh, he's the managing director of SynchroSite Watch uh, in Tanzania. Uh, Kibaya, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning, team. Uh, thank you so much, Eric and team, for having me this morning. Yes, as introduced by uh, Eric, I'm Kibaya, currently managing director at uh, Synchro Site Watch here in uh, Dar es Salaam, uh, Tanzania. Synchro Site Watch is a contracting firm uh, dealing in electrical and mechanical engineering services. Uh, we offer uh, electrical services, electrical installation, maintenance services 
and power management solutions. Our current biggest clientele is Milcom, uh, trading as Tigo in Tanzania. Uh, before this, I have uh, predominantly been in the telecom sector. And as you might be aware, most of our operations are based on uh, the upstream suppliers uh, getting spares mainly uh, from China, from India. And this is where we have had hit uh, from a contractor and data center management perspective. We manage data centers for Milcom uh, Tanzania, and this involves end to end, including the spares, storing, uh, fuel management, ensuring that the teams are on site 24 seven. So the impact of uh, COVID on our operations uh, has not been that significant apart from the stocking levels of the spares that we need to have, and then ensuring that uh, we have adequate uh, sufficient supply of fuel uh, on site. As an organization, we are also involved in other uh, management of uh, air conditioning systems. We are the current uh, regional partner for Rolls Royce power systems within the East African region. Uh, that line of business had also a hit because we are maintaining the MTU engines. So overall, we have had uh, an impact on uh, post-COVID, but quickly what we have learned is uh, inventory management and stock management. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kibaya. Um, last but not least, um, Sandeep Bashu, CEO of Jasco Construction, uh, again, based in Tanzania. Sandeep. Thank you, Eric. Um, my name is Sandeep Bachu. I'm the managing director of a road construction company in Tanzania. It's called Jasco. Most of our uh, works or clientele are the government. And uh, the impact that we have had with uh, COVID is actually very minimal. Most of our operations uh, have actually been more or less normal from day one. Um, something additional that uh, has really helped out is the government's uh, approach to it because they have minimized the, 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 they have minimized the way the people and the country as a whole look at this virus. So the impact with that is that life has been pretty normal and taking into account that we are a country that is still developing. There would have been a very big impact if the awareness, if the awareness had been uh, more dramatic to a certain extent, we are actually very well off than uh, other countries, I would say. Uh, so that's the brief from our side. Excellent. Thanks for, your, for the introduction. Um, I'll now give the room to um, Jonathan, uh, who will be facilitating the, the discussion further. All right, thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to our panelists, uh, the team here, for, challenge, for sharing your challenges. Quite, quite an interesting and diverse uh, set of challenges from Uganda, which I think, uh, just judging by the sentiment, probably had the most uh, strictest and stringent uh, uh, lockdowns to Tanzania, where, the, where, the, where it's, it's, it appears that it's almost business as usual. Um, so, and also quite a variety of challenges faced across different regions and different sectors. But I'd like to focus our conversation today uh, based on um, the discussion we had just earlier around two particular pain points that have come up during this COVID period, and that's around supply chain. And we can think about supply chain as the movement of raw materials from the producer or manufacturer um, external to your business, to your manufacturing or production site. And secondly, the distribution, which we, would, which we can define as the finished goods movement from the production site or your uh, manufacturing place to the customer, right? So just to give a, a brief introduction, Kenya as a state took some measures at the start of April to restrict movements between countries, counties, especially between the two major hubs. Nairobi and Mombasa. Uh, subsequently, uh, they closed the borders with exception of cargo with neighboring 
uh, countries. Aman, you mentioned in the start that there were uh, some significant challenges with regard to distribution. I know your business is centered around good distribution, whether coming to the retail shops from overseas, e-commerce, um, online consumers. How would you say uh, this challenge is, you know, maybe you can go into more detail around this challenge and, and what are the solutions that you're putting in place to be able to mitigate these problems? Yes, thanks, uh, Jonathan. Uh, so, one of the one of the the the, the positive impact, uh, should I say, that uh, that COVID has uh, had on uh, our distribution to uh, to our consumers uh, has been that it accelerated overnight the adoption the adoption the adoption of uh, online shopping. So, one of our segment of uh, distribution is uh, e-commerce on top of our retail. Uh, on top of our stores business and also on top of our wholesale business, uh, e-commerce, which uh, used to represent a very tiny part of our uh, business, uh, literally grew triple digit month on month for the past four months, and that literally happened overnight. The moment the first case, the first case was announced in Kenya, so that was March 16. Uh, the week after, we've uh, had to. Uh, We've received five times more orders that uh, that we do, um, so that I think that was that, that, that was a great impact and that was a very positive impact on the back end. Uh, that kind of revealed that we do not have the operations set up uh, to support an e-commerce business because we're at heart for the past sixty-five years that we we've been uh, we've been trading. We've been a more of a wholesale-driven business where we ship full truckload of. Uh, and full pallet loads of, uh, of products to other distributors and other retailers across the country and across East Africa. Um, to now having to, uh, to ship one book, five pens, and maybe two uh, 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 laptop accessories to, uh, to a customer really deep in, uh, in, uh, in the western of uh, Afghania has been quite challenging for, for us. And also not doing it into the single digit of orders per day, but doing it at scale uh, almost into the quadruple digit uh, of orders on a daily basis, uh, have literally pushed us to to shift uh, overnight from the from being a wholesaler to become more of a of a direct to consumer online uh, online business, uh, and also have to set up the operations for for, for for it. So what we what we decided to do was to uh, because we have a wide network of uh, distributors across the country to uh, to tap into that network and to try to fulfill some of these orders uh, directly from our from uh, our uh, distributors and from our partners at country. Uh, the other issue that that brought is that we didn't have any of the data on the on the inventory, so we didn't know who was holding what, and it literally. Uh, we had to use our customer service team to call the main customers, to call our main distributors of the country, to start uh, to see what they could fulfill and what we had to actually fulfill from Nairobi. Uh, uh, what we also did was to, to tap into our retail network, our own branches uh, in Nairobi, to start fulfilling some of these orders, depending on when, uh, where, which, tier, which part of Nairobi the order was coming uh, coming from. So if there was, there was a customer in Westland, then we'd be dispatching you to our branch in Westland, uh, etc. But that, all of this kind of represented about half of the demand of uh, our online uh, online business since uh, since COVID started, uh, which we, uh, to be able to fulfill the other half, we literally set up a, a fulfillment center dedicated to online, uh, online orders. Uh, we managed to do that within around one week of uh, hard work uh, uh, and uh, now I would say that it's slightly uh, doing better but we definitely understand that we uh, that we need to invest to uh, to really support this uh, this uh, this channel of activity uh, as this is uh, a lot of people were all talking about the new norm of uh, post covid post covid we don't have any idea of when that's going to happen and how that's going to happen but uh, I, i'm pretty sure that the new norm will be uh, Will be uh, online uh, online shopping on top of going to uh, physical branches. So, so right. Armand, I have, I have a question for you. So, how did you like? Did you take like social distancing or like public health advice in even just setting up your 
fulfillment center and how did you do that so we did we we we, we did it uh first of all that was a that was a reduced team working on it, working uh, working on it uh i think what what happened in uh, in nairobi and across kenya is that we we do have a curfew uh but we didn't have a complete lockdown so nairobi has been on lockdown so people were still able to move in and uh, to move within nairobi but not uh, not in and out of nairobi uh, so pretty much we've been we've been operating the, the the whole time the team has been coming to the office uh, drastically reduced because about 20 percent of the team have been uh, um, have been uh, have been sent on leave because uh, of the level of activities uh, and uh, the team in the office and in the warehouse obviously has been trained and educated on uh, on, uh, on the, the health advice to be able to fight uh, to be able to fight uh, uh, COVID and um, so we've been we've been following all these uh, all these guidelines uh, which are pretty much the same across uh, across uh, across the board yes. Um, just to <clears throat> just to uh, follow up on on, on your discussion, uh, Arman. Thank you very much. Uh, with regard to so kind of post COVID, do you see your business evolving into a more online retail store where you will then kind of phase out your textbook center shops, which are located in Nairobi, and then moving into a more online presence and setting up uh, the distribution more geared towards online. Um, so, uh, accelerating online, absolutely, uh, there's, a, there's a strong demand for it. Uh, phasing out some of our stores uh, right now, uh, maybe not. Eventually, uh, I think repurposing these stores into providing more of an experience to consumers still wanting to come to shops uh, will, definitely, will definitely happen. Uh, while also using them as uh, pickup centers for some of the, the customers that do that uh, that prefer to come uh, to come pick up in a uh, in a uh, in a uh, in the shops. Uh, we're we now fully adding a uh, an online component to our distribution. And uh, while before it was kind of merged into uh, our our stores activities, now it's becoming a full standalone of our of our distribution. Uh, and uh, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Kevin, if I can just jump uh, jump onto you uh, and, and and have a quick discussion. So you've, you know, we've worked together for a couple of years now. Um, yep. And I know that your business relies on a good supply chain of ready-made products, raw materials, as you mentioned, that were coming from Southeast Asia. Uh, you're seeing kind of demand for COVID-19 products, screens, social distancing kind of, uh, you know, layouts. Yep. Uh, from from your point of view, what would you say? Uh, how how are you meeting this demand? Number one for these these new products, and how are you able to tackle the challenges uh, with regards to the supply chain, so raw materials and finished products? Sure. So I think the the first major thing to happen was the spike in demand for home office furniture. Right. So we've okay. supplied home offices probably once a month for the last few years, and then sort of. 400 people all at once needed a desk and a chair in their house. Um, and so similarly, we're geared towards, you know, corporate processes. You get a quotation, then we approve, then we, you know, home office is a lot more retail based, similar to sort of the TBC story. We had to learn how to deliver tomorrow and like stock up quickly. And, you know, people just want to come pay, put in their car and go. So it was a very new um, process for us. And that involved just simplifying the range to sort of two types of desks, two types of chairs, and making it quick and easy. So I think that was one of the learnings is simplifying your range at this time and learning what you really want to sell. Mm -hmm. Then beyond that, we were sort of completing projects that continue to go. So we had to identify sort of uh, new and alternative suppliers within Kenya and abroad very quickly and understand our, so both Kaizen and Lean have been teaching us about Kanban levels and reorder levels. So with demand falling, you know, completely we had to sort of readjust our stock levels very fast so that we weren't going to be overstocked for you know what would have been two months of stock of something now is worth nine months right so just trying to be very smart on stocking and new purchases so we don't um, increase our cash flow like uh, cash tied up in stock and then we found that there was a need for better forecasting so 
we've been trying to get this forecasting game correct for a long time. Now, obviously, all numbers are out the window, but there was almost a need to build a scenario planning thing that said, you know, when COVID started, we were like, in three weeks, everything will be fine. So it's a blip. Then it was in three months, everything will be fine. Then it's now, you know, it might be three years, everything will be fine. So understanding a model in which we forecasted best medium and worst case scenarios of sales and therefore supply. And, you know, oddly enough, the thing we don't want to be caught out on is when things do pick up and we forecast it too low and then we run out of stock and it takes, you know, two months to replenish. So I think all of, I can see people shaking their heads that you don't end up out of stock either. So there's a fine balance between like toning it down and then being ready for when things ramp up again. So that's been the real challenge, I think. Um, and that's it really, just taking decisive action on those areas. Okay, so simplifying the range, understanding your stock levels and forecasting your sales, the key challenge. Those are the kind All right, of and maybe just one more is that this, um, obviously to manufacture furniture, you need a full factory. So when we lost half our workforce every day, when we were rotating or social distancing, there was a lot more efficiency gains as well. Obviously demand was lower, so output was lower, but we just learned how to work with fewer people. And that's sort of an outcome of something we've always been trying to do. And now we sort of had to test that theory as well. All right. Now I just want to, I had a, just a question on the, so you've, you've had to like, in, in terms of your chairs, look for new suppliers coming from Malaysia. Yeah. Has that been a, an uphill task? Have you, have, was that easy to find? How were you able to set up your new contracts and negotiate? The, the reality is because Southeast Asia is the cheapest competitively, once China did open up um, and Malaysia and Korea, actually we just probably ended up back to them. I think there's also a risk of too much change. Like the chance of COVID happening again is fairly small. Like obviously it happened, but we did have a range of suppliers, but they all got closed down at the same time. So it's not like we could move to any other country. So actually we concluded on that strategically like we had a wide range. We're happy with them. This thing affected all of them simultaneously across all the countries. So actually, we're just going to pivot back to making sure we have a wide range again. And there's not much we can do in that scenario, oddly. Yeah. And then going forward, do you see uh, like having uh, kind of reserve suppliers in the list, like having s set up, you know, contracts that in case some of some suppliers can't supply, that you're able to then leverage your network on other suppliers that you've managed to to work with? Yes, I think internationally that's easier. I think locally is where we're learning that because in case COVID forces any companies to close, smaller companies who supply, you know, nuts and bolts and widgets, that's actually where we have the challenge because they might have, we might have been relying on a local supplier who's been the last 20 years. I think that's been the learning that we need alternative local suppliers. Actually, internationally, yeah. much easier because, you know, millions of companies doing everything. So locally is where people couldn't get out of the port. People couldn't get... Um, doing all sorts of interesting things like that. And I've just seen a okay. question on online. So yes, again, online presence is useful, but we supply corporates who traditionally still have quite traditional processes in placing orders for $10,000, $20,000 of furniture. So we've sort of thought about new ways to improve that process without them coming to the office necessarily. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin, for that. Um, so just going back to uh, to the panel, so from what we understand, the Tanzanian government has taken a different approach by staying away from lockdowns and restrictions. Uh, Kibaya, as, as, as you had mentioned, Tanzania does rely on trade between the SADC region and some of the trade with East Africa and countries. Uh, you mentioned your business is centered around telecom services and working out in re remote locations. So maybe you can just go further into uh, discussing how you've managed to you know, work with your team, organize your team to meet the work and provide the service. Are you there with us? Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I just want to quickly highlight a few things, uh, just picking up from the fact that yes, the Tanzanian government has not had a complete lockdown, like what probably Uganda, yeah. Kenya, and all the other territories have had. But then our experience has shown that uh, lack of a complete lockdown uh, still has an impact on the bigger uh, farms. On smaller farms, small and medium enterprises, yes, if you don't have a lockdown, they are able to survive. But then when you have a supply chain that is globally interconnected, 
and then China has locked down, India has locked down. So even if Tanzania has not locked down, we still found out that there was a huge impact on our upstream suppliers. For example, just mm -hmm. before, before COVID, we had placed an order for compressors from the UK. We had placed mm -hmm. an order for air conditioning units from India. And on the compressor that we had placed an order from the UK, we had a significant two months delay. So even when mm -hmm. these compressors were, we managed to pick them up up to Nairobi, picking them from Nairobi up to Dar es Salaam took another three weeks delay. So yes, there was no complete lockdown in Tanzania, but then for services that rely on a supply chain that is globally interconnected, there has been a hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, but for smaller farms, yes, definitely they were able to they were able to to survive uh, as usual. Now, can so if I can just pick up, yeah, if I can just pick up before we go further on the on the two months delay that you face for these compressors coming out of the UK, what 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 were the, you know, what are the solutions or how were you able to manage that situation with your client and, and you know, or, or come up with an alternative supplier? Maybe you can go into that. Yes, uh, unfortunately, we did not have uh, local alternative suppliers for these particular compressors because these are huge uh, compressors where the manufacturers are quite limited uh, globally. So what we had now to do is to have a, a, a revised maintenance routine for the units that required these compressors. So the teams were now dedicated on site and babysitting these uh, air conditioning units to ensure that nothing goes wrong. So it, it required us now to sort of have a revised maintenance routine and keep mm -hmm. the units running until these compressors were able to be shipped into the country. Yeah. yeah okay. And uh, still on the part of the, the, the impact on the upstream supply chain, whereas we had gotten an order from India at a specified sum of uh, logistics charge, eventually when we were able, when we were about to place the order, the logistics uh, managing company on the other side said no, the logistics charges have increased 100%. And okay. yet we had already gotten a PO from the client. Now all of a sudden the charges have gone up. So we have now to go back into the negotiation of the contract that we had actually initially seen. So as much as the Tanzanian government has not had a lockdown, but there has been an impact in one way or the other because of the interconnectedness of the global supply chain. Now, as an organization, how have we been able to manage uh, the teams uh, during this uh, lockdown? Uh, first of all, we were, it became mandatory that we look for ways of ensuring that our staff are able to reach the sites in any way. So we in, had to introduce dedicated transport uh, model for our engineers, pick them from home, drop them to site. Because the services that we are providing as an organization is a 24-hour based monitoring service. We have, have we have to have our engineers on the data centers 24 seven. So we had to arrange for private transport for the engineers to pick them from their homes, drop them to the data center and back home to avoid them being uh, getting into the public means of transport. And then uh, we had to set up bulk fuel reserve tanks on all the data centers, because then we were not able, we were afraid that the supply chain in terms of fuel management and delivery to the sites could be an issue. So we had to set up bulk fuel uh, facilities on all our sites to ensure that we had fuel available 24-7. Uh, and then additionally, we, have, we had to ensure that we have enough stock of uh, spare parts that we normally use in the day-to-day -day maintenance of uh, the telecom infrastructure. So this is how we've been able to, to survive up to this time. And we thank God, yes, we think the situation seems to be getting better globally and uh, most of the yeah. Uh, supply chain opening up okay thank you for that if i can just i can just pick up from there so you've you've talked about an increase in distribution charges that that made you renegotiate <clears throat> with your customers you've had to dedicate increase in transport which then tells me that your costs are going up you've had to increase your storage bulk fuels your working capital is being consumed how how has that how have you managed uh, maybe you can uh, just go slightly into that um, on on using up, you know, because you've, it looks like there's more cash being used up. Um, and and is, has there been some assistance? How how have you managed to to do that? Well, yeah, fortunately, what we did, we had uh, a very close engagement with the uh, Milcom uh, Tanzania, 
where we agreed on the disaster on the uh, business continuity plan we said look this is our business continuity plan this is the amount of cash that we will need for us to survive for the next six months out of this cash that we need for us to survive for the next six months how much of this can you be able to push on us in terms of adverse payment so we discussed with uh, with the, our upstream immediate uh, client for a cushion in terms of adverse payment on some of the stocks that are very critical to the running of the data centers. So the experience that we've had from this COVID uh, scenario is a very close relationship between the contractor and the client. So there has to be a very close relationship in terms of the continuity business planning on our side, as well as tying it into the, uh, the, continue, the business continuity planning mechanism of the client so that we have a seamless service at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Um, well, we're still on Tanzania. Sandeep, we've talked many times about road construction, about getting asphalt aggregates on time to your sites, uh, getting your machinery and equipment ready for road construction, and similarly also reducing your cash burn rate. Um, now, you've, you, you mentioned in the start that, that you know, um, you've, you've had limited impact due to the COVID-19 scenario. Um, how would you say that you you know when you with regard to products or you know uh, you know like bitumen coming in from abroad, how have you managed to deal with that challenge and what are the solutions that you have put in place? One of the uh, challenges, the minimum challenges that we have had, is an importation. Importation, I would say, of maybe of uh, spare parts and various type of raw materials. So some of the raw materials would be bitumen. Um, special type of steel structures mm -hmm. and uh, if there's any importation of equipment which is done from time to time however the delay would have been a couple of weeks those are more we look we term them mainly as capital goods when it comes down to equipment and if it's uh, if it's uh, in terms of raw materials there's always we've always kept a, a, a big amount of supply you know, so we have quite a bit of stock in place that can cover us from two to three months because we are constantly importing bitumen and a lot of uh, raw materials. So the impact that happened, I mean, uh, to, 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 to Mr. Kabaya in terms of uh, the supply chain, I would say was just something that, that was not taken into account in advance. If there were measures taken into account in terms of having sufficient stock, definitely take into account the amount of uh, financial strength that um, the company holds. These things could have been uh, avoided. On the other side, that is basically maybe the only um, impact that we have had. The other impact that we have had is just trying to show the awareness because not many of our employees, we have quite a bit of semi-skilled and skilled employees, close to, close to about 700 employees in total. And it's to give them the awareness because uh, everything has been downplayed. So just to keep a bit of awareness in terms of social distancing, uh, sanitizing, you know, providing uh, sanitizers and masks to all employees on a regular basis. 700 employees is quite a bit of uh, it's quite a bit of a task taking into account that these are various projects across Tanzania. So we're running. Uh, approximately five projects currently in various parts of Tanzania and uh, that is one of the only challenges but apart from that in terms of our payments from our gov uh, from the government they've been coming through in terms of uh, employees turning up or let's say talking about curfews um, we've had none of that we've had none of that the only impact that was there initially and now it's more or less subsided is uh, the importation which uh, we managed to tackle it way in advance. So, yeah, that's from that's it for me. That's uh, quite a positive outlook from uh, from Tanzania. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, now, if I if I just go on to Uganda, so Uganda took a more stringent approach and went into lockdown for almost two months to combat the spread of virus, except for cargo and essential travel. Uh, you go like covering your business really relies on a good distribution. 
um, to get the products to the clients and you, you discussed some of that in the earlier discussion. Um, what I'd like to uh, just go into is, you know, you've, you've, there's a lot of different mechanisms that you have brought up, um, you know, being able to work with the, with the curfew, the shorter hours, uh, no commercial flights, so your shipping has not been, uh, has not been favorable. Uh, maybe you can just go into more depth in terms of uh, how you how you'll be able to mitigate these challenges and 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 take care of them. Yeah. So um, right now, in terms of uh, to address the distribution challenge, um, really, as I mentioned, um, we previously we used um, open truck vehicles uh, where we could load, um, you know five to eight cylinders and cluster the customers together. So we would do like one single round of distribution. Um, now, once all private vehicles were basically banned, um, it, it became like, became extremely difficult to get the authorization to do distribution this way. Um, so instead we had already like started uh, some pilots on distributing using motorbikes um, so we quickly like recovered these and um, asked our delivery drivers, uh, the ones that were able to, um, the ones that were able to drive a motorbike, to simply do like a one-to-one -one distribution. Um, so it becomes a lot more uh, inefficient, but uh, it allowed us to maintain a certain minimal level of service uh, to our customers. Um, the real so. Right now, things are opening up a little more, so we're able to do like uh, more cluster distribution uh, again. But uh, the real challenge is around um, customer acquisition. Uh, before, it, it's no longer really feasible to set up a demonstration table and um, you know put your product out there um, and to really. Um, you know, attract the attention and interact with like hundreds of people. So right now, what we're testing is see how we can like really move towards like referral. So um, we're contacting our customers to see the ones that have given us positive feedback in the past um, and try to create a program for incent to incentivize them to refer friends or family so that we can like the friends or family can already see the product and we can just distribute like a new unit um, in the neighborhood. Um, so that's the approach uh, we're uh, thinking of using. So, um, so if I can that, just jump onto that, um, Hugo. So you, you've talked about customer acquisition, you've talked about uh, product presentations and it's, mm -hmm. it's been difficult. Are you able to leverage uh, digital uh, platforms or digital means to be able to do that going forward. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't have a website yet. Uh, so we're, we were not ready for that. However, we, we had a Facebook page going. Um, and so we were like, we ran some of those promotions through the Facebook page to attract referrals. Um, the next step, if things really, um, don't change, uh, we'll have to build a try to build like a website and use, uh, we have some promotional videos that provide a good introduction to the product and see if we can start attracting attention and interest uh, that way. Um, so yeah, right now we are not in a position to do that. Um, but if, you know, if the current restrictions and fear from like the customers and our employees continue, we'll have to uh, be more creative and use other mechanisms. Okay. In the interest of time, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut short on this and go into our last uh, panelist. Um, with regard to the DRC, the first COVID-19 case was detected in Lagomba, the main business district in Kinshasa. The government moved swiftly to introduce a lockdown, but the virus has since spread to seven of the country's 26 provinces, including the mining hub of Lubumbashi, our chip, uh, mini grid solar installations require, as you mentioned, a lot of imports from Asia. Uh, and like Sandeep, you need to have your projects running with sufficient resources. Maybe you can go into uh, how you've managed to keep the projects running uh, 
and, and what, what have you set up to be able to, to have your resources there? So yeah, again, uh, thanks. Uh, you know, on, on our side, as I said, uh, Nuru um, uh, um, uh, uh, is producing um, uh, um, power. We also trade and distribute um, um, uh, power um, um, in Eastern Congo, right now mainly in Goma, where we have deployed 1.3 megawatts of um, uh, solar hybrid uh, system in Goma, but also we have uh, into our pipeline um, uh, a lot of uh, sites where uh, we, uh, we want to uh, deploy um, additional uh, 23 megawatts of uh, uh, um, uh, energy capacity by 2021. Uh, and the only reason why we exist is because we want to uh, provide uh, a world-class connectivity experience to our clients. And, uh, and that depends on our ability to really provide the quick service uh, uh, and also connect quickly uh, clients once they are onboarded. And, um, and so all, all, all this depends really on our ability to have enough um, uh, uh, equipment and materials into our stock, pools, cables, meters, uh, uh, and to do that, but also to have enough human resource capacity to mm -hmm. deploy on the ground uh, to connect our clients. But uh, so far, we haven't been able to provide the, the world-class experience efficiently. Why that? Only because we have been um, uh, um, running out of stock many times, not, not because we, we, we couldn't anticipate um, um, uh, that by ordering more equipment, but you know, with the lockdown, um, 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 as, um, the, uh, the situation um, and knowing that we also depend really on the um, uh, on uh, on uh, international markets, we uh, we are actually uh, importing most of our our equipment. Mm -hmm. Even our 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 um, suppliers um, they have been um, struggling since you know with the limited stuff in their factories, the production went quite down. But also um, with the transporters that we are dealing with, they have to go through several countries where they, there is lockdown, like in Kenya, from Kenya to, you, to Uganda, Uganda, then up to, to DRC. It could take them most of, uh, in the past, even three days to ship poles, for example. But now with uh, the COVID um, our situation, it's taking more for about a month. For example, we, we ordered um, um, a, a, a number of, um, uh, Tools from uh, from Kenya, but it took us almost three months to get them here. Around. So, so we kind of delay a lot to connect our our, our clients. So, uh, that has been most of one of uh, the, the the biggest challenge. So, so, so also, just taking so just hanging on that. Uh, sorry, Archip. So, have you what what have you done to be able to combat that, mitigate that delay? Have you is is there anything that you can do? No. Number one. So, so what we did now is, you know, so before we had, we were working only with um, uh, just limited providers. Uh, we used this opportunity now to, um, to 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 scale up our ability to identify many uh, providers um, at a regional level, but also at the local market. So um, uh, that's uh, we have been also able to start manufacturing pools. Locally, um, we identify some of the, uh, the people with the capacity to, um, to quickly supply some of the metals and uh, good technicians that can produce post locally. That's have allowed us also to look at, at the local market uh, as an opportunity where we can be able to uh, just um, um, mitigate those issues. Um, but also just on, um, uh, as, uh, um, on, on, on a human resource, um, capacity to deploy that, you know, with the social distance, um, distancing um, the reality, uh, we have been able really also um, uh, really to um, um, to integrate into our uh, really our payment system, um, 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 a mobile mind payment system, just to kind of make sure we can continue to provide the best service to our clients and also recover money so that. Uh, because we have been also experiencing uh, the fact that most of the, the clients with the lockdown situation couldn't move up to our office 
to, to pay. So uh, really on the, on the supply chain side, uh, we have also just used this opportunity to, to uh, then uh, do, uh, publish more tender if, uh, that, that's allowed us to identify much of uh, providers and vendors um, uh, to mitigate those issues. So now, right now, we have been able also to kind of anticipate our inventory and stock management because now we have also identified some of the transporters and uh, suppliers who have been also competitive during the COVID situation to anticipate yeah. how to provide good services. So right. um, that's how okay. we have been doing that around. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arship. Now, in the interest of time, uh, I'll hand it back to Eric. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come through, and uh, I'll, I'll hand it back for you to deal with to, yeah, to deal with those and hand them to the panelists. Th thanks, Jonathan. Um, thanks, everyone, for for your participation. Uh, just maybe maybe one question that uh, came up about um, local manufacturing. I mean, Arship had a word about that, and you know, how can we? You know, as businesses use more of the, um, you know, local factories, local manufacturing, um, and how do we can we empower them uh, to 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 help with our businesses and and develop them to support uh, businesses as well. Uh, I don't know, may, maybe Kevin. Uh, I think that that question was a bit addressed to you. Maybe you can give us some, some more content on that. Yes, so we've been local manufacturing office furniture for about 20 years now. And we think the big, the big win there is obviously not to hold massive stock on a variety of goods. However, the, some of the things that are difficult to local manufacture are things that we just can't, we don't have the volumes for, like chairs, you need plastic you know, wheels and arms, which in China they make millions a day or millions a month, and we use sort of a thousand a month. So that's where the, the real thing is. And we're finding some challenges where the government is making it difficult to set up new factories, tax laws. So I'm in this very interesting place where half my business is local, half is imported. I would actually say importing is easier operationally, but it drains cash. So it's a very balanced act that it would be good to make something locally where you can gain some competitive advantage. And it'd be great if the government supported us with cheaper power, you know, easier employment laws, things like that. So that's my stance. Excellent, thank you. Um, does any other panelists want to to bring some insight on that? All right, then we're good to go. Um, I, I think, in the interest of time, uh, we'll we'll cut it here. Um, thank you very much to everyone, um, participants and panelists. I think it's been a great discussion. Um, obviously, not enough time to to cover everything and and may have some, some follow-up discussion at some point. Um, again, thanks a lot uh, for participating, for joining the call, um, and wish you a very good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone, and thanks, Eric. Yeah. All right.